Uh, welcome back, everyone. This is our second session of the first day of the 14th Miami Media and Film Market. Those also sound like good lotto numbers to play. We had a, a lotto short last night that we're going to talk about later today. Uh, but this is a really, really exciting discussion that we're going to be having now uh, with uh, a good friend now, uh, Mr. Juan Carlos Cotto, uh, who is just a, a very, very, very talented um, writer. He is a, a director. He's a showrunner. Um, you know, I won't go through his whole bio because it's in our program, but it's extensive. You know, over 30 years in the business, uh, working on some of the top television series uh, in the world, really. Uh, just some iconic shows that you've all heard of. Uh, but we're going to start with a little clip from one that he's most recently worked on, which is the hit now ABC show, 911. Uh, and let's just go ahead and run the clip. live in your invisible girlfriend's house and you're telling me about weak excuses. Yes. Hello? disasters and crime and all these big visual things, but there's a reason I showed you that scene about uh, Eddie and his Tia Beppa, and it's because of her. There she is. That's my Tia Beppa on the beach in Cuba. And the reason I show this is because I think the most important lesson I want to impart on everyone today, and the biggest takeaway is that what you create should have a piece of you in it, and should be personal, and should be emotionally tied to you, and should come from you. This is one of the first things I wrote on the show, this is season two, I think the first thing I wrote was uh, a couple of kids who, who cement their heads into a microwave oven and then end up in the pool and they have to rescue them. The second thing I wrote, the second thing I wrote was this the Abepa scene, and I went to them and I said, listen, I had, and, and by the way, I'm not, it's not just a name, because the Abepa was Jolieco Moloco, Metiche, said what was on her mind, she was the truth, the truth teller in our family. So I, I, Thea Pepp was on that screen, right? And she's that character in the show. If you watch the show, she, she makes a couple of appearances over the years. And she's the Thea who comes in and tells it like it is, right? So I put that character on the screen. I went to the show and I said, listen, I have a Thea Pepp. This is who we need for the scene. And he was like, that's great, write the scene. So, you know, we made her very sarcastic. You know, the line where she's like, I thought you guys all dressed alike. You know, it's a very, a very specific thing and I think that the, the specific is universal and the personal resonates and, and I think that's what I've always tried to do with everything I write and everything I do no matter what I'm doing even if I'm writing for another showrunner and another, <coughs> in a, in the voice of another show I am always trying to inject myself into it somehow because that's gonna make me care and that's gonna translate to the screen it's gonna make people care so anyway that's why I started with that Oh, a round of applause for Juan Carlos Cotto. We're going to leave Tia Beba up there. Yeah, why it's not? Like, yeah, yeah, it's like a Cuban household she was in awesome. Aaliyah. You have to have your family pictures in the yeah. background at all times. She just looked like a great lady. Yeah. Uh, so now let's take a little step back. Yeah. Uh, we went way back with Tia Beba. Yeah. But now we're going to take it back personally for you. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you from? Okay. Where you grew up? 
I was born and raised in Orlando, Florida. My parents fled Cuba in 1961. Uh, my dad was a physician, my mom was a school teacher, uh, and they arrived in, yeah, in 61, and so I was born in Orlando and raised there, and came down here to the University of Miami, uh, and went to school here, and I was here for those four years, and then while I was at UM, I started writing for the Herald. I always wanted to be a writer. So her sister, my tia, Abuela uh, Adela, was uh, a sort of a, she wa wasn't sort of, she was a concert pianist, but her husband died in Cuba, uh, my grandfather, when my dad was three, so she wasn't able to sort of pursue art, and she had a brother who was a songwriter, so we were all sort of artists, right? But she became a single mother, and she imparted in me a sort of a love of words and a love of books. Every time we bought a book, we wrote our name in it, and we wrote the date we bought it, and, and she was a poet, and so she, she gave us all the bug, and she gave my brother Manny the bug as well. Manny passed away last year uh, from pancreatic cancer, but the reason I backed up is because Manny sort of stole my dad's Super 8 camera when we were kids, and he started making Super 8s, and I, he was older than me, so I sort of caught the bug from him, and that was really my first job in the business was PA on his Super 8 films when we were kids, right? And we were just, and we would make all kinds of crazy stuff. So I took that on, and so in high school, instead of book reports, I would make Super 8 films, and. And I always wanted to be some kind of writer. So I figured I was going to write novels and be like Hemingway. So I came to Miami to, to sort of connect with uh, the culture down here, which is my culture, and, uh, and ended up writing for the paper and was sort of following the Hemingway path, right? You know, journalist and novelist and all that kind of stuff. But not just any paper. All right, right. Yeah. The right. Herald. The Herald. <laughs> the Herald, which made my dad very proud to know him. And, um, you know, I immersed myself in, in my own culture, in my own identity, even at the Herald. That, you know, I came down here to sort of write movie reviews, and that's what everybody wanted to do. And I quickly realized that that was just sort of a spectator sport. So I started writing about local music. I started writing about Cuban music. I started writing about local radio and television. And so I really got into what was happening down here. You know, I did the first profile about Dulce Sandoval when he defected and, and wrote that for the Herald and then wrote another version of it for Downbeat Magazine. And that ended up getting adapted. This was sort of a full circle for, moment for me. After I had been on the show for about five years in the early 2000s, they adapted a couple of my articles as for Love or Country, the Arturo Sandoval story for HBO. And I had a relationship with Andy Garcia, so he brought me in and I was sort of a consultant on that movie, which was really kind of cool. So anyway, um, I came here and from here, uh, Manny was already in LA and he was doing movies and he's like, you gotta come out and you gotta be a writer and you gotta do it. So I went out to California with my wife in 1992. So that's, I don't know, what, 33 years ago? And um, it was just us in the Mazda 626 with some clothes and our vacuum cleaner. For some reason we brought our vacuum cleaner, I don't know. Is that Tia Pepa? I don't I guess, I don't know. I don't know, por ahí we stuck it in the back. We, you know, it was like, what are we doing? Anyway, so we drove cross country, and uh, and our carpets were very clean for the first few days of my um, And you know, I got here, and Manny was like, I'm "Gonna get you an agent," and he got me an agent at UTA. And of course, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. So your brother moved first, right? Mm -hmm. He was here. For, he had been here since '83. He came. Uh, he had gone to Loyola in New Orleans. And they had shut the film school down like halfway during his time there. So he made a short film. Mm -hmm. And he came out and just, he was working on sets and doing stuff. And, and he had sold at that point a feature and, and said, you got to come out. So, but the agent thing quickly just faded away because I didn't know what I was doing. And, and I had like one sample. So my wife worked at uh, Home Savings of America, right, downtown. And so for about two and a half years, I'd wake up every morning at 4.30 with her, drive her to the bank because she had to be there for the East Coast time. And she worked at the bank, and I would go home and write. Mm -hmm. And over those two years, I think I wrote seven screenplays, because back then, nobody wrote television. You know, you, you, was, you wanted to be a feature writer, right? right. Television was like, you know. <laughs> so, and they were all pretty terrible. Um, but I, I basically hit the, I just was hitting the golf ball over and over again. I would finish one and start another one, show them to friends, get feedback, and sort of learned how to write. And, in the interim, had a manager briefly, but the UTA thing, like I said, went away. So one of those scripts was Die Hard in the White House, right? Because back then everybody wrote Die Hard in a blank. You know, it was Die Hard, Die Hard on a Bus, which eventually became Speed. And, you know, a friend of mine used to joke that he was going to write a movie called Core, which was Die Hard in an Apple. <laughs> um, 
So Die Hard in the White House it was called 1600 Pen, which I'm sure that script circulated around and that title ended up getting used in a, in a Wesley Snipes movie. But it was about a, it was basically about Bill Gates taking over the White House. It was, it was okay, it had some spy stuff in it. So I ended up, uh, it ended up on the desk of a guy at Activision, which is a computer game company, mm -hmm. right? And they brought me in to work on a game for a month, and that turned into nine months. And that was nine months of writing scenes for the game, creating puzzles for the game. It was a whole new sort of form of entertainment. And at the Christmas party of Activision, I met an agent who hired me to be the, inter I was going to be the interactive client because CD-ROMs were going to change the way entertainment came into your home, right? The CD-ROM revolution, right? That was it. It's like, you're going to do all the CD-ROMs. I'm like, great. And he brought me under the agency, and uh, like literally a month after, I think I got, I did one CD-ROM, and then the whole market imploded. And he was like, pardon my friends, he was like, fuck it, write a TV spec. <laughs> so I wrote an ER, uh, and that script, it was a sample ER. Back then, you didn't write pilots and, and, and all this stuff as a sample. You wrote a sample of a show that existed so that you could show that you adapted to the voice of another writer. Right? So I got eight VHS tapes of, of ER that from my sister-in-law who was taping it. I watched them. I mapped out how the show worked, how many scenes were in each act, and how they structured the narrative. And I wrote a spec ER, and that script got me work for 10 years. Wow. And it, was, it was very useful. And it was, um, it was just a great tool, you know? And so it was about just creating, it was the same thing in newspapers. You had clips, and if you had clips, people would hire you in the newspaper. So you just had to keep writing. So I always had a script or always had something, and even when I, if I wasn't employed, I always had something written and something ready to go. But, so that, in 94, I was, I was at the game company. So in 95, so basically about three years, three and a half years after I got there, I did a show, I did an episode of a show called New York News, okay, which was ER at the New York Post. Mm. Right? Basically, it was uh, Mary Tyler Moore as, uh, as, she was Janet Chesmer. I don't know if anybody remembers who Janet Chesmer was. She was the editor at the Herald. Anyway, it was it was her as the head of the paper, and then all the reporters as kind of the ER doctor staff. And so I wrote episode eleven. It was a CBS show, but they only aired seven of them, so my episode never even aired. Wow. So that was that was exciting. Uh, <laughs> and then I did freelance on two episodes. I did a, and, and this was I, we could I could talk about the pitch process for hours, right? But. I did a, I don't know if you guys remember a show called Viper, which was yeah. about a car. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. So I went in and pitched, and again, it was literally one line, and I said, Viper versus a helicopter. I'm like, what are you talking about? I go, well, the police have a helicopter, right? So what if Viper takes on the helicopter and the bad guy's in the helicopter? I'm like, great. <laughs> so that was the whole pitch. And they didn't let me write it. I did the outline, and they didn't let me write it. So uh, three months later, it was six weeks after my first daughter was born, I landed on a staff of a show called The Pretender which was uh, about a guy who could be anything he wanted to be. And that ended up being my graduate school. I was on that show for four seasons. I wrote 15 or 20 of them. We made 88 episodes. Those guys, they, those guys had come out of Stephen Cannell, so they let me do everything. They let me do pre-production, post-production, and production, and I learned everything. CBS. About, it was NBC. It was on Saturday nights, and it had 13 million viewers. Yeah. Uh, and they were always trying to cancel it because it was famous. Uh, pilot because the pilot tested so high and it wasn't it was produced by Fox but it was it was on NBC and Warren Littlefield who ran NBC didn't like it because it wasn't his right so he kept trying to can it and he kept moving it around the schedule and we always got a number and there were always these shows that were you know we would have kept going but the star was kind of a pain in the ass so and they killed it but anyway so that was my graduate school from there I worked really steadily for right. for 30 years I took a couple of years where I was sort of off doing pilots and stuff but Yep. So yeah, you just pretty much, and so so talk about that transition now. So you know, obviously you had to pitch a lot. You had to break into the business, right? Mm -hmm. Once you were in, did that kind of change the scenario? Once you were on a full time staff for the first four seasons, was it like, all right, now I'm on this short list that my obviously agents have, that studios have, yeah, uh, that just constantly kept you working? Yeah, I mean, it, it was. If you if you uh, come to play and you deliver and you work hard and you create ideas and you you know, serve the show and serve the showrunner, they will ask you back, right? And right. If, you, if you're collaborative too, you know? Um, and that's part of it. Uh, it was really, um, it was really about knowing what show you're on and, and being able to, at the same time you put yourself into it, put yourself aside, right? It's sort of like, 
you know, 911 for me on that first season was very much learn. I started on second season. They had already done a season. So you have to have the presence of mind to say, yeah, I'm bringing my own voice to this show, but I'm also learning how to write the show. I sort of had to learn how to write the show from the showrunner and from the other writers who were already there. And, and that involves listening to what they're telling you, reading the scripts that they put out, watching the show, right? Really learning the show and loving the show you're on, right? And finding a way to, if you don't love it, find a way to love it, right? And that's not saying sell yourself out, it's just figure out a way to put the epepa into it, right? Figure out, and there's a bunch of other stuff in that show that's personal of mine that is deeper than even the epepa, the, the emotional stuff that happens with characters and stuff. So um, it's about, you know, figuring out a way to connect to the show so that your heart and soul is going into it every yeah. day, right? But it did, it did help a lot that I was on, you know, sort of a list as a working writer. Right. Uh, I mean, look, to back up again, a perfect example of the lows in your career. When I, when I got out there about a year and a half in, um, I had the help of Manny. I had the help of Manny and his writing partner, Brian, who had sold a script called The Ticking Man for a million dollars. So Manny and Brian were literally the hottest writers in Hollywood. I mean, they were up in the top five. And so we went and pitched a show. I had an idea for a show. Uh, it was called The Mirage. And it was about a test pilot. It was sort of a $6 million man rip off, but it was, it was called The Mirage. It was about a test pilot who goes up and in the atmosphere suffers like a radiation thing, sort of like the rays kind of thing. And, when he, and he crashes and when he comes back down, his molecular Makeup has been changed to the point where he can bend light with his body, so he's literally a mirage. And so he can become invisible, and he can appear as a, whatever. And he becomes a spy, naturally. Yeah. He becomes a spy, and he catches other spies. We went and we pitched this thing to Spelling. And they were going to supervise it and, and, and approve it, and if I messed it up, they would rewrite it or whatever. I did a whole pitch, wrote a script, whatever. And they bought it in the room. They were like, we're going to buy this, right? And we celebrated it. And uh, we, were, we were in Orlando, we went back to see the parents, and I opened a bottle of champagne, whatever. And literally like a week later, Spelling called and said, yeah, the executive who was in that meeting did not have the authority to buy that project, so we're not oh, buying it. Yes. So it was like here, and all of a sudden that was here. So that picture of me <laughs> opening the champagne, I put on my wall in my writing room, uh, and I looked at that fucking thing every day. That's how I wrote the next five scripts. You know, so it's, 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 you know, even if you're on a list, quote unquote, it's highs and lows. Always. Yeah. Always. Yeah. Always. yeah. Always. Always. No, there's always ebbs and flows. And just when you think you've met it, it's like one step forward, two steps back. Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, you kept building these relationships over the years, mm -hmm. right? Which is critical in terms of talking about that ecosystem in LA, right? Mm -hmm. and, and how you were able to get in and, like you said, adapt because. Mm -hmm. So many writers go in with this auteur idea that it's my script, my words, I'm gonna change the industry, right? Mm -hmm. And it's all, the, it's gonna revolve around me like the sun. But right. it doesn't usually work that way. No, no, it doesn't work that way. And uh, it doesn't mean you can't do your own thing and it doesn't mean you have your own corner to do your own thing. And that's where development comes in because I do find that if you're out there pitching a pilot, like we talked about in the last seminar, uh, last panel, you, they do want something personal and they do want something emotional. It's one of the things that, that I thought about while, when, when they were talking to the panel is, you know, there, there needs to be, this, the, whatever you're pitching has to have a reason for being, but that reason for being needs to be you, right? So I'm not going to go in and pitch a series about a Scottish warrior, you know, because I'm Cuban-American from Florida, and so it doesn't mean I have to pitch something Cuban-American, but I have to pitch something that only I could write, right? That's the other reason I use the Tia Peppa example. Right? I always tell writers that if, if you hand in a script, you, they should be able to tear the title page off and read it without the title page and know that you wrote it because it comes from you and it sounds like you and it is you, right? So I think that there's a balance there, right? Um, you, you, when you have your moment, be ready and have your personal idea and be, make the world revolve around you. Right. But to get there, you need to collaborate. It's a team sport. I yeah, mean, it's a team sport from the beginning. No, you're right. right. Otherwise, you can write novels. Right? Yeah, and it's, uh, yeah. It's it's a different game when you're collaborating, and especially in television, right? Yeah. You know where you mm -hmm. have. Talk a little bit about the kind of writers room experience, because you know a lot of folks that want to get into that business, and I know obviously over so from the '90s to now, writers rooms have changed yeah. quite a bit. Yeah. But in general, kind of what is that environment of, of writing as a team? Well, I mean, it's basically about uh, wherever you are on the totem pole, but mainly if you're starting out, it's about generating ideas and 
keeping the beast fed, right? Because generally what happens is, on a show like 9 any show, but 9 is an example, the writer's room starts about seven or eight weeks before prep. So that means you have seven or eight weeks to sort of talk about the character arcs for the whole season, the shape of the season, the, in, this, in the case of 9 what's the big opening disaster, uh, where are we taking the people this season, and then, and then what are some of the first episode ideas, right? And then you start putting down those ideas, whether it be through research or one-pagers or whatever, or pitches, and you're generally in a room with about eight to 12 writers, and you have to collaborate, and you have to talk when, when it's your turn to talk. Now it's a Zoom sometimes, right? It depends on the show. And um, you basically put all those ideas together and figure out a sort of a big shape of season, and then you start to sort of break it down to episode by episode. Generally on number one, what we would do is then do smaller rooms, right? So it would sort of be the showrunner and the writer whose name's gonna be on that first script, and a couple of other writers, and it's just the four of you sort of pitching ideas for how the structure of the show will work, what the episode's about, all of those things that come you know, creatively uh, in breaking an episode. Yeah. Um, but but uh, it's changed a little bit, not only because of Zoom, but because uh, the shows are so short now, for the most part, broadcast, we did 18 episodes and I won, but now it's 10 episodes. So now you have these rooms where, um, and this happened when I was running Dusk, sometimes they'll have these things called mini rooms or boot camps where the writers come in for six weeks and you do all the stuff, you break a lot of the episodes and then everyone goes off and writes episodes and then you come back and, uh, and then you compare the scripts and the showrunner usually rewrites or has the writer rewrite um, and then you get the scripts together and then you start shooting a little later. But what the problem that has created is uh, writers are not getting the experience I got on Pretender and many shows after, which was I was on set, I was running the thing, I was producing, I was learning all the aspects of it, which ultimately makes you a better writer because you understand what it takes to shoot something. You know, if you write a sentence, you know, the, the example we always use is exterior of the ocean day, the fleets meet, right? So it's like, how do you shoot that scene? What is that? Right. Right. So it's sort of like, you, know, you have to know what you're putting on the page and what it takes to, to, to execute that. Right, and yeah. so yeah, understanding budget, scope, right? Mm -hmm. The economy mm -hmm. of words, but you have to describe it enough so that right. a, a producer or director can look at it and go, okay, I get the vision, right? right? right. right. Uh, so in terms of like, you know, you talked about that moment where you sold a project mm -hmm. and then lost it. That was a low, obviously. Mm -hmm. What would you say is your biggest or one of your biggest highs, professionally speaking, at, uh, in, in terms of your career? I mean, my first one was The Pretender because it was not only about getting hired and taken seriously, but it really was this rush of just learning all this new stuff and also getting to execute all these things that I had done since I had been making Super 8. So that was, that was a big high. Um, another big high was working on a show called Invasion, which was set in Miami, and it was about um, aliens invading Miami in Homestead. Right. And, and Eddie Cibri, I don't know if you guys watched it, it was on for 13 episodes on ABC after Lost. Uh, and Sean Cassidy ran it, ran it, and you know, much to my agent's dismay, I passed on uh, Bones to take that show. They, they wanted to hire me, I always joke about it, you know, they wanted to hire me as a co EP on Bones, and wow. I'd probably have a vineyard now, because you know, Bones <laughs> went in for 14 years. Um, but I went on invasion now, I was like, how can I, I looked at my agent, I was like, how can I not do this show? It's about Cubans and aliens, it's like everything I love. <laughs> I'm gonna do the fucking show, and he's like, okay. So I did the show. And it was crazy and it was fun. Uh, and that was a real high point for me because I was just, you know, sort of, to me, the sort of the sweet spot is a genre show that kind of speaks to everything that I'm about. So that's always what I'm trying to do. And then uh, another high point was a show after that. It was actually 10 years, five years after that, Nikita, which was on for four seasons, which was the same. Really great experience with people you loved. We shot it in Toronto. Um, and and again, that was a show. She was a, it was a show about an outsider trying to change the world, and so I found my way into that as well. Wrote a wrote a character named Ramon, who was a Spanish assassin. It was a great uh, played by a Cockney British guy, a oh. Greek great guy. I forget his name now, but he was this great actor who was Greek and British and Greek. So, but he looked Spanish and he had a Cockney accent, but he did a great he did a great Castellano. So anyway. He was the, the, the he was my sort of my uh, my doppelganger in the show, um, and then uh, after that, it, it, Nikita was an interesting thing because we did four seasons, but the last season they only gave us six episodes, 
to end it, right? And we sort of did like a mini-series. But it, it took almost just as long as a regular season, so we were all kind of screwed. We didn't have other jobs. So the showrunner was like, you know, write your episode, do your thing, and start looking for other stuff. So what happened there was my agent introduced me to Robert Rodriguez. Mm. And, uh, you know, he was looking for somebody to do shows for his new El Rey network. And I had a meeting with him. And again, this is part of what you were talking about. Once you get on a list as somebody who is a, either about to be a showrunner or a writer or somebody they can trust who can collaborate, um, you, get to, you get into certain meetings, right? So I went to this meeting with him. And this is a perfect example, again, of what Joe was talking about with Tom Hanks and stuff, right? I go to this meeting, and, there, and I get told in the meeting, before the meeting that he wants to hear ideas and he's looking for things for all right network so i go in and i'm talking about this idea and i'm talking about that idea and he and i are just talking about movies and we're chit chatting you know, we're, we're same generation we you know we love jason and the argonauts and all these great old movies and he starts talking about from dust till dawn his movie that he wants to do as a series and and so i start talking to him i love that and i start talking about it some more and whatever and i go back to my ideas only because i was told we were talking about other things but i noticed i read the room he kept coming back to dust and so the meeting ended, and he called me in for another meeting. And I come in, and he starts this conversation about different ideas. And then I just looked at him, and I said, you want to do dust, don't you? And he's like, yeah. <laughs> so let's, it's interesting, because you mentioned you know, coming up with ideas. And, and obviously, this is where, as a writer, right, it's a unique profession in that you take a lot of that work home with you, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So how do you balance kind of like the personal with the professional time? Uh, obviously, you mentioned having a family, you're doing all that. How does that kind of work in your head? Are you able to separate the two, or how does... Uh, wine? Wine. I wine was, helps. Okay. No, I'm just <laughs> um, I, look, I mean, for me, I always tell people, uh, this business that we're in, it, it doesn't matter. Mm. It doesn't matter. And I'm not saying that just to be highfalutin, but it really doesn't matter, guys. I mean, it's a, you know, you can make a hit film, and it'll be... It used to be a DVD on a shelf. Now it's just a bunch of ones and zeros out there somewhere, right? What matters is, is what you have at home, your family and your mm -hmm. children, and that's life. And that's not only um, the very real reason of, you know, it's not, it's only about your heart and soul, but if you want to take a more mercenary approach, life is where you get your material. Right. I mean, if you want to look at it that way, right? Um, there's a lot of my life and everything that I write, uh, and that comes from, you know, you cannot forget to live. And sometimes I do forget to live. Sometimes I do get consumed uh, in writing, and Yali will tell you that, you know, that uh, uh, it is, it does follow you home, and the ideas are always there, and I am always thinking of stories, and I don't, am always trying to figure stuff out, but you do have to figure out a way to turn it off and, and realize that living life is, is super important, it's yeah. super important. Yeah, I, I get that you're always in your head from my wife. It's like, yeah. wait, come back yeah. to us for, mm -hmm. yeah. for a second, but it's, yeah. you know, it's part of a creative business, right? Where yeah. A yeah. lot of it lives in here, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And then, and then I again, under the heading of life you know, in influencing the art, I'm working on a project now, a pitch about a detective. And in, in researching detectives, this detective who wrote this book started talking about how he, he's twice divorced and he has uh, you know, tenuous relationships with his children because the work follows him home and it's always in his head. The cases are always in his head. I mean, this is, of course, different. He sees these horrific things every day. But even in seeing that, it's like, I understand that. <laughs> I understand how something can consume you to the point where you're ignoring the people you love, right? So again, use that in the work, right? Yeah, yeah. No, that makes sense. Yeah. So um, I, I want to definitely get some questions from the audience, but before we go to that, um, obviously there's some younger writers in the room. What, what tips would you have in terms of breaking into the business, especially today, which as we mentioned, has evolved dramatically since the early 90s? Um, what, what general advice can you give for a young TV writer out there that wants to be the next showrunner, you know, the next J.C. Cotto? Um, look, the, the apprentice, it's an apprentice culture, and that still very much exists out there. It is about going out and just starting to work in the business, sometimes as a PA on the set, sometimes as an assistant at an agency or in the mailroom, literally. All that system is still there. It's changed a little bit, but it's all still there. So. I mean, if you want to get in the television business, it's about going to Los Angeles and starting to work. I mean, yep. some of our writers' assistants started out as PAs on set, right. making coffee, running around, ADs. Other ones started, I mean, one, one of the writers on 911 is the daughter of a famous um, 
television writer and director who worked on the X-Files, right? Which is, again, in your head, you're probably like, great, she's a Neville baby, it was easy for her. But she was a PA on American Horror Story for 40 years. Wow. And then two years, spent two years as a writer's assistant on 911, and then became a writer, right? And in that process, learned everything, had to learn how to write, had to learn, you know, and it work, worked her way up, and is still working her way up, you know? Right. One of the writers on the show for five years was the showrunner's assistant. Yeah. So it's really about, you know, finding your way. And for me, since I had been a journalist, I think they trusted me as a kind of a writer of words. So I never had to go to the assistant round. Mm. But I did, I did have to know how to pitch. And that's a skill that I had learned at the paper. Because at the newspaper, you had to come in and the editor would be like, what are you writing about? I'm like, well, there's this arts festival, this Cuban artist is holding this thing, and it's supposed to be, you, know, you had to be able to pitch the thing in the elevator pitch, you had to be able to pitch your story. You're like, nah, I want to do that. Or, yeah, that's great. So I kind of had learned that skill, you know, sort of ad hoc. And it teaches it work quickly, right? Because in the paper, it's a new story every day, kind of like television where you're telling a lot of stories, right? Yeah. It's a different tempo than mm -hmm. sitting in your room and writing a feature out, right? Yeah, no, that's why I loved television from the beginning, because it felt like a newspaper. Yeah. You know, leaning back. Oh, wait, how do you spell what? <laughs> hey, well, is your character in the thing? I don't know. Did you write that scene? You know, and walk down the hall and say, I'm stuck. Or, you know, walk down the hall and say, what are you doing with that episode? And I'm doing this before. And all of that collaboration is, is really the fun energy of being on a staff, right? Which has died a little bit with Zoom. And I'm sort of against all that shit now. I mean, Zoom is taking over, has taken over since the pandemic. And a lot of people aren't going back. But... I like being in a physical room at, le at least at least four days a week. Uh, yeah, I feel like that's where the magic happens when you're just sitting around and you're out on the mienda, you know. Like, oh, what'd you do? <laughs> I don't know. What'd you do this weekend? Da -da -da. And then somebody gets a crazy idea, and it's like, you know, I saw this thing over the week, you know. And that's where it comes from. That doesn't happen on Zoom. It doesn't yeah. happen. On Zoom. No, you're right. It's a different energy when you're. When you're luckily, we are in a room, uh, yeah. and we're going to take a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, here, so if you have any questions for JC, uh, just shoot your hand up. And uh, all right, let's start at the. Back. I saw this hand first, so it's kind of like uh, Jeopardy. You gotta, she hit it quick and hit the button, like Family Feud. Um, so yes, we'll go here and then we'll go to the front. Um, so my question is, I liked how you said everything you write should come from a place within yourself and be very personal. Does that, because that's very vulnerable. Does that come with? self-criticism or doubt for yourself and if always so, yeah how do you overcome that because i'm also cuban and there's so much drama in my family <laughs> and i feel like if i put it on page people will be like this is so over dramatized so, and it feels kind of it's real for me but how can we translate it in a way where people can also connect to it well, I think it's about, it depends on the medium, meaning if you're writing it for another show. If you're putting it into another show, you have to kind of adapt it, right? Yeah. Like, for example, that Tia Beppa is Mexican-American. She's a little younger than my, my Tia Beppa was my Tia Abuela, really, right? Um, but I took sort of the spirit of her and put it, I didn't break that episode, and I wasn't a writer on that episode, I just wrote that scene. I think I wrote one other thing in that episode. But I wasn't the main writer on that episode, but the showrunner came to me and he said, listen, we're doing this scene after the emergency at the... The saddle the saddle 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 and I live there. I've had my own emergencies at the saddle ranch. Yeah. <laughs> he says, <laughs> we're doing the scene rights. where Eddie and Buck, we're doing the scene where Eddie and Buck go in, and the scene's not about the Abepa, yeah. but it's sort of about finding that emotional reality about her and putting it in the context of the structure that already exists and using it to move things along, right? And because she's sort of a truth teller and a pain in the ass, it, you can kind of push things in a comical way, right? So it's about... I always find it's about reducing the sauce and boiling things down to their essence. Right? It's like I always use that analogy. Like, what's the what's the emotional essence of the character you're after, and what is their purpose in the scene or the story? Right. Right. And then, who in my life is like that? Right. Like, who's this person remind me? I mean, I often will just go into a voice in my own head of somebody I know. Oh, this person is so and so, and I start to imagine them talking to me as this character. Right. So there's different ways to access it, right? But there is definitely, it, it is about the vulnerability and about being honest with yourself and being honest with all the self doubt. There's a lot of self doubt. And I sort of work my way through that by, I, I, do, I do everything longhand before I write. I don't write the whole thing longhand, but I sort of talk to myself on the page by writing and, I, you know, and, I, and I'll just write stuff that's bothering me, you know? And you can't, let those voices in your head, you can't listen to them. You can, if, if you write it down, it's a good way of letting it go. Right? Just kind of 
put it out there, mm. let it die. You know what I mean? That's good advice. All right, we're going to take a question over here. I think we saw a hand in the front. Yeah, JC, how, how do you think AI is threatening the writers in the industry? Uh, not at all. Right now, not at all. Maybe in 10 years. Uh, I, do, I thought that was a cudgel by the studios just to try to get us to bend. I don't think it's... It seemed that was a delay with the strike, right? Yeah, yeah. They, were just, they were just using that as a... I think it's, I think it's scarier for actors. Mm. You know, I had lunch with an actress uh, last week, and she was like, at every audition I go to, now they ask me to sign off on my likeness to scan me so that if... You know, they got to come back for a scene or something, and then she's in the background or something, they can just drop her in digitally. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah, so, especially in the voiceover world, I heard that that's even worse. That's, right. But, uh, but yeah. for right, I'm using AI, but I use AI like a better search engine. So, because I find that the AI is really good at organizing thoughts, right? So if I'm researching, for example, you know, Spanish artifacts or, you know, weapons of the ancient Philippines. I'm just like, what were the what were the weapons used by in, in ancient in the ancient Philippines or in the colonial Philippines? You know, boom, 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 and it gives you it organizes it in sentences, and it's useful that way. But I have I, I, as a joke when I was on 911. As a joke, I said, write me a scene of Buck and Eddie, you know, arriving at a car wreck, and and there's a woman in the back seat. Or whatever. I gave a couple of details, and it was terrible. It was terrible. <laughs> it was terrible. So. I mean, it's just, I don't know, the, the, the human element is, is always, I think, going to be necessary. Mm -hmm. you know, the, without the Tia Peppa, the theme doesn't work. Right. Yeah, I think we talked about that at one point, that there's a perfection and imperfection sometimes mm -hmm. uh, that gives a specific color to a story. So I think that's, that's really smart. Yeah. Um, okay, we have one, maybe one more question. If we have, I thought I saw maybe one, yeah, there was a hand over here. And, no, you, go, yeah. go for it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, as a writer myself, I appreciate all the insight. I mean, yeah. there's a lot of stuff I really relate to. Uh, are there any resources that you that you kind of uh, uh, circulate around, like, or, or revolve around in terms of like writing books, or, or maybe particular uh, screenwriters, or, or even television screenwriters? I collect things in an Apple Note of just things that I see online um, that resonate with me. Uh, there's a great if you look up David Mamet's letter to the to the um, unit writers. That's a great piece of writing. Um, there's also an article, I forget the guy's name. Um, this guy who wrote, I think it was for Slate Magazine, but I can boil down the essence of it. But he was a TV writer, wrote a lot of TV movies. And his whole point was momentum and clarity. Because that's what people want from scripts. They want momentum and clarity. And it's so astute. They want the script to move, and they don't want to be confused. And the more than that, you don't really need, right? You just need to keep, obviously, you need. Things, but you know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's a great piece of advice. Um, I don't know. I'm trying to think of some of the other things. A lot of it is stuff that I've just heard, and um, and I'll put down as things that I've learned or things that I've learned on set. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the truisms now. I don't have them in my head, but there's a great sort of every scene. Like when you start a scene, there's like six things that I think about. Right? It's and I'm just trying to remember. I haven't written down the movies. It's um. Uh, what is the scene about? Where have I been? Who has the power in the scene and who wants the power in the scene? What does each character want in this scene? And where does the scene fit in? Actually, the first thing, the first most important thing is what happens in this scene? Which sounds like a stupid question, but it forces you to, again, as I was saying, reduce the sauce, right? So you look at that scene in the hospital, right? It's what happens in that scene. Well, uh, Buck, you, if you said Buck accompanies Eddie into uh, the hospital to talk to Tia Beppa about Christopher, well, it's not actually the scene, because it's actually Eddie's scene. It's not Buck's scene. The point of view, that's the first question you answer, right? So Eddie goes into the hospital and talks to this Tia Beppa about Christopher. Buck comes along, right? There's a Buck downbeat at the end of it, right? But you have to basically whittle things down to their simplest essence and write from that, right? It's about clarity. Again, and momentum. What happens next, right? Where am I going next? Well, structure, right? One scene leads to another. You know, one of the things that I wrote down a long time ago, the comment, the commentary on um, Ocean's Eleven with Steven Soderbergh and uh, Ted Griffin is very good, and they talk about how writing is transitions. Writing is transitions. It's about take the, every scene ends and sends you to the next scene. Right. Read uh, uh, what's the book? Uh, 
Da Vinci Code. Every chapter, the Da Vinci, it's, it's a kind of a silly book, but every chapter ends with, you know, he turned and looked and could not believe what he saw. <laughs> <laughs> what did he see? Like, like, fuck, I gotta look and see what he saw, right? You know what I mean? Sometimes it's that kind of transition, sometimes it's a cut. Sometimes somebody asks a question and you cut to the answer, sometimes it's an emotional thing, but this next scene should feel like it has to happen. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, that's that a great way to actually end the panel because yeah. we're going to transition to the next panel. Great. Great. And you ended it on a perfect button there great. Uh, with the great J.C. Cotto. Give it up for J.C. Everyone.